find your community, find your tribe, and you can do it actively by getting involved with writers groups, whether that's online or whether that's in your hometown. Very often libraries will have them. They're, they are there and they are waiting for you. And above everything, believe that your story is worth writing and worth hearing or worth reading. There is someone out there waiting for you to do that. And you have a gift. The gift didn't come to you just brand new when you were born. There are people in your history who have been writers, who have been artists, who have passed that on to you. Your ancestors are lined up behind you right now. The voiceless and the faceless and those whose stories were suppressed, those whose stories were brutalized out of them, they have made it this far to bring you this far. You are where you are now as a writer because of them. That is a gift. What are you going to do with it? Okay, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. And I'm so happy to have my guest today. You have no idea. We, we've we been chatting before we hit record, and we've already had a great podcast. And now we get to do another one together. Uh, we had our own private podcast, so um, <laughs> we weren't recording again. So, yeah, we, it was great. So welcome to my podcast today, to the Living in the Next Chapter. Uh, Sandra's with me today. We're going to be talking about uh, all, all the great things that are happening. I have a page full of notes from the last time we talked. So there's so many great things to talk about today. Welcome Absolutely. to Living the Next Chapter. So happy to have you here. How are you? Thanks so much for having me, Dave. It's such a delight to be here. And as you said, you know, we've been chatting away and now I've even forgotten what we talked about originally. So <laughs> I hope you're going to give me a clue. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to go through and do this together. Um, you are so engaging and so kind. And I just feel like I'm 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 here. I'm at your home with you and just. We're just relaxed and having a great conversation, and it's going to show as we go through the episode today. So thank you for making time for all of us, myself and those that are listening. Really appreciate thank you. it. And thank you, everybody who's listening. It's such a delight to be with you. Awesome. Okay, so let's fill everybody in. First of all, I love to do this. Where are you in this great big world of ours? I'm in Portland, Oregon. Excellent. And what is so amazing about Portland, Oregon that keeps you there? Well, first of all, uh, as anybody who's familiar with the Pacific Northwest, there is a distinctly moister climate up here than there is, for example, in California or Texas or any of the other uh, sun-blessed states, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And I have a condition called uh, chronic dry eye syndrome. So my eyes are very happy <laughs> to be up here in more moisture. So that's one great thing. Um I love also the bridges of Portland. And that's actually a, a work that I'm just finishing the first draft of, is I've been walking all of the bridges. And there's such a phenomenal um, range uh, from the suspension bridge, which is St. John's Bridge, right at the top, right at the north end over the Willamette, all the way down to, I believe it is Ross Island Bridge, which is the southernmost bridge. And there are bascule and um the, what are the different types now of course now i'm now i'm thinking yeah. about it I can't remember all the names but there are all these different types of suspension bascule bridges there's bridges specifically for traffic only like markham bridge but a number of them are pedestrian friendly yes so you can actually walk across the bridge which is not good if you're actually going on the Ross Island Bridge because it's a it's a highway, so you can almost feel battered by the traffic as you cross. Yeah. But then there are the beautiful bridges like Tillicum Bridge, which was, was specifically built for um, transportation, but not cars and bikers and hikers. And so you've got a lot of space to cross through the bridge, across yes. the bridge, and it's just yeah. beautiful. See, and that's what I love about having a podcast is I get to meet people and live vicariously through everyone as they explain why they love where they live and i love it so i'm up here in canada near niagara falls mm. i have this big hill with lots of water people love it for some reason and come <laughs> from all over the world to see it and i for me that's the one thing that i i would really like to encourage people listening no matter where you are in the world what is that special thing that mm. that you that you might take for granted right mm. as you cross the bridge every day to and from work you're like, wait a minute, this is really gorgeous. I live yeah. in a beautiful place. I live near Niagara Falls. I, it's a hill with water. I'm like, oh yeah, that is really amazing. You know, I got to stop and 
recognize um, what's the beauty around me, right? I think that's about being present, I think. Absolutely. Isn't it astonishing what that does? I mean, you go to Niagara, which, as you say, you know, the hill with water, but something transformational happens when you stand in front of a, a waterfall that magnificent, right? And I've been lucky enough to go to some of the ones uh, like Foz do Garçu in Brazil and mm. uh, Victoria Falls in um, uh, up at the top of South Africa. But standing in front of any waterfall, there's an obliteration of all the chatter that usually follows you around, purely because of the noise. Yeah. Right, yeah. And then you just have to stand there and absorb, hopefully not too close, so you don't yeah. get too soaked. No. But yeah. the idea, it just, it eliminates everything else, and you get that chance to be in the moment, like you say, that idea, idea of being aware. To me, that's everything. Just that it's, moment where you can be yourself. It's captivating. Right, Absolutely. you're. Everything else doesn't matter. You're just standing there, impressed by the the, the immense size of what's happening, and the sounds, and the power, everything. It's just, it's amazing. So, yeah, anyway, and there's a be, real. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I was no, say, I was, there's a real sense of infinity there as well because yeah. the water keeps coming. So that's our, that's our yeah. our touch with infinity. <laughs> See, we're already getting so surreal already. I love this. Um, <laughs> this is really, really fun. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this is living the next chapter. And I might, might create a podcast just about Niagara Falls now that I've talked to you about it. Um, but <laughs> let's talk about your author journey because we have authors listening. We have readers that would love to connect with you and connect with what you're up to. Can you talk a little bit about the origin story of your author journey? Uh, I was always a scribbler when I was when I was a child, and I used to write really bad poetry. And I think when you're a child, you know you you feel it's so amazing to be able to make anything. Um, and I learned to keep it to myself <laughs> after mm. mistakenly sharing it with my family. Um, so I think everybody starts somewhere, whether it's journaling or writing poetry or doing a little bit of you know just a paragraph here and there. But it eventually grew into something much bigger. And that happened when I realized I wasn't really British. Um, you won't be able to tell listeners because you can't see me, but um, I'm brown. And um, my family is Sri Lankan, Anglo-Indian, Portuguese, Dutch, and Scots. And I only came to the realization that I wasn't just one thing or another thing when I went to Kenya for two years and lived in that incredible country and went through all the stuff there. When I came back, I thought, ooh, I'm one of those people who's been colonized. That's mm. where my background is from. So I started trying to find answers to that, you know, which you can do historically. And then I suddenly realized, you know something, I think I have stories to tell about this. Mm. So I started writing and it was short fiction, made a very brief early foray into novels and realized I couldn't do that at that age. Uh, eventually I did a, a degree, an MFA and frankly, listeners, if you're thinking of doing an MFA, I think it's a good idea, but choose your MFA carefully. Make sure it's got what you want it to have. Make sure that it, you've got, uh, at least somebody you recognize perhaps on the staff who's a writer you enjoy, because then you've got, you've got so much more impetus, so much more reason for actually going through an MFA. Mm -hmm. And then, after that, I was writing short stories. Short stories turned into a novel, and my first novel came out. Uh, I had a very understanding publisher who took what was essentially a collection of short stories and taught me how to make that into a novel to create that connective membrane between stories that turn them into chapters. And uh, after that, I, it was all long fiction. I still write short fiction, but I um, must admit I'm very engaged with long fiction. And I think, you know... People who are writers who are listening in, um, it doesn't matter where you start. Just start. I think the worst thing that can happen is that you get that judge on your shoulder thinking, you know, you think, oh, this isn't good enough or I should have written that sentence differently. That will all come in editing and in recrafting. But just get the first draft out. I think that's the most important thing. Amazing. So here okay. I yeah. So just to jump back in case somebody's listening and they're like, Dave, I'm afraid to put up my hand in this class because I don't know what an MFA is. Can we just expand on that a little bit, just in case there's somebody listening going, uh, uh I hope, yeah, can, can we talk about that <laughs> yeah. just a little bit, dude? Of course. And yeah. I hate people who speak in acronyms, and I just fell into that, didn't I? No, it's a Master of Fine Arts, and it's, it's a, between a two- to three-year uh, degree course, 
um, I did mine part time. I worked and put myself through my second degree so that I wouldn't get into debt. So mine took a lot longer than three years. I mm. think it took between about five or six years because I just did a couple of classes every semester while I worked part time. Nice. But you get to meet people. That's the thing about being in a in a degree, uh, an advanced degree program, is you meet people who actually want to be there. And they actually care about writing, whether it's playwriting or film screen, uh, screen plays or whether it's poetry or fiction. It doesn't really matter. People have actually got a real impetus, a real incentive to be there. And that's where you find your community. And that's what's mm -hmm. so cool for writers. You need a community. You must have the tribe because it's writing is such a solitary occupation, as you know, Dave, right? Mm -hmm, yeah, but having, having a group around you. Who give you feedback and what you want is your group to say, that's great. Keep, keep doing it because, you know, the critique and stuff can come later, like in class, for example. You want to need to know that you can keep going. And that's what I think MFA programs do. Nice. So, okay. So on the topic of community, I love where we're going with this. Um, we have new authors listening. They're in the beginning stages of writing. They have no community. They have no audience. They're brand new and having an audience that follows you along on the journey of writing is really engaging because your audience gets to see it develop and get to talk about the cover art and, hey, this is my book idea. What do you guys think? And you bring people along on the journey. And when the book comes out, you have a built-in, pent-up excitement for the book launch because we've been there from chapter one all the way to the end. and We're cheering you on as the author. What is the what are some of the critical things we could do at the beginning to start a great community around our writing process? There's a number of things you can do. Uh, first of all, look in your hometown and uh, you might find that there are classes offered or there are groups that already exist at libraries. Um, if you're a little anxious about doing uh, in-person or IRL stuff, there are a number of online communities you can also join. Hundreds of Facebook groups are looking for people who are writers who will not just contribute, but be able to give critical feedback. That's the way to become an excellent writer is to be able to read and give critical feedback on somebody else's work. And when I say critical feedback, it's not just about what you think is wrong with that person's work, but what are they trying to say? How can you hear that? Mm. Um, I think that's the most creative way you can have about reading your own work and reading someone else's work, is what is the story trying to say? What's the story that wants to come out? Somebody gave me some really good advice about that once. It's just not what you want to write, but what is the story that wants to be told? Mm. And when you have a group around you, when you can get into a group and start giving other people feedback as well, your writing improves and you, be, you get to know your story so much better. That's an interesting. I love that point of view. That is... That's that's great. So as far as finding your voice as an author, any any thoughts around you know because if you're your first time writing, you're you're still trying to figure out your approach, you're trying to figure out your style and how you communicate. Any thoughts around finding your voice? Oh yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> finding your voice as a new writer or young writer is a little bit like uh, falling in love. Um, you tend to, you know, rush from person to person. At least I did. I'm very shaming, <laughs> shaming to admit this. <laughs> Trying to find the right person. Right. So you go through a lot of voices. You might have favorite authors whose work you love and you try to emulate that. And that is one way to get into writing, but eventually you're going to find all you're doing is copying that author. And that's not your authentic voice. Mm -hmm. The more you keep writing, the more your voice will develop. And it's not a straightforward journey. It takes a lot of trial and error. Uh, the one thing I would, I always tell students is don't try to be funny. Don't try to be romantic. Don't try to be, um, JK Rowling or whoever it is you, you love. Yeah. Is allow your characters to do that for you. Because your characters are funny and dramatic and romantic and bitter and harsh and all the rest of it. And they will, if you allow them, they will reveal all of that for you. Okay, so this is a, we're on a great trajectory here. I love this. What about 
the whole idea about who would ever read my book, Sandra. Like, there's so many other great authors in the world. I'm hesitating on even starting because, again, I have no audience. I've never done this before, and I'm not really confident in my message and my voice. Who would ever read my book to begin with? A little imposter syndrome happening. Any ideas around battling through that? Absolutely. Um, and it is a tough one because there's, so, you know, you've got that little judge sitting on your shoulder, the, the shoulder editor, right? Mm. Oh, that's wrong. Nobody would believe that. And you, that description is rubbish and all the rest of it. So here's a suggestion. Take that shoulder editor, put it in a jar, fill the jar with water and watch it drown and then get rid of it. Okay. So try to keep the, the judge out of it. Mm. Secondly, all the stories have been written. If we're looking about plot, looking at plot or theme, so many stories have been written, yes, and that can be daunting. No one can tell the story that you have to tell in the way that you will tell it. Mm. It's not about the end point, it's the journey, right? If we're going to use that trope. It's about how you, with your experience, where you come from, whichever town you've grown up in, or whichever country you've grown up in, or whatever family you've grown up in, that voice, that story is specific to you, and no one else can tell it the way that you were. So when did you learn that lesson yourself? Probably when I was about 30. Mm. Around 30. And I suddenly realized that I loved writing about children in difficult circumstances. So my sociopolitical backdrops for um, the short stories I write are Nigeria, Palestine, Pakistan, Sudan. So these are, these are war-torn countries or politically agitated countries. I'm not saying that everyone should do that, but I used to get outraged by the injustice against children mm. and so that outrage fueled this need to tell those children's stories and those voices and they're, they're not despairing they're full of hope they're funny they're innovative they're incredibly loyal they are the best of us and to me that was just really important and i've read other people who write uh, children's stories or uh, not children's stories children's voices and do an incredible job. I mean, but we are different. We tell the story differently. And to me, that was, okay, this is something I can do. Nice. Okay, so let's talk about what you've written and, and what you're working on. Can you kind of give us some backdrop about some of the, the projects that you've had in the past? Thank you. Uh, well, the first novel came out in 2014, and that's called Losing Touch. And it was a fictional account of my father's family's move to England, settling in post-war racist Britain. Um, he developed uh, spinal muscular atrophy. So there wasn't just a loss of culture and custom, but a loss of himself, his physical self, mm. and how he changed as he went through that life. And so you see London through their eyes in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, the second book was a collection, uh, a very short collection, actually. It's called a chapbook called uh, Small Change. And that was three award-winning stories that were about children in other countries and how they survived. And then the third book is, is another collection called Tripwires. Again, mostly children's stories or young people's voices from around the world. And the book that is going on submission now is a fictional account of my mother's life growing up in Sri Lanka, then leaving home to go to Bombay, Mumbai, to do her secretarial studies. And she never came home after that, never saw her family again. And then wow. from there, she moved to England um, post-independence in India with my father's family. And she had to move around England because he was in the Air Force, the Royal Air Force. So you move every couple of years. And um, I, I knew very little about her. She wouldn't talk about her life. So we didn't have a very close relationship. I'm sure a lot of listeners can resonate with that. But when she died in 2019, I realized I don't know very much about her. So I knew all the points of departure. I knew geographically and I knew the timeline, but I knew nothing else. So I had to imagine myself into her and, and her voice as she told the story. And that did a lot because it actually brought me closer to her. And I found at the end of the book, I could say wholeheartedly that I truly loved her. Mm -hmm. 
what a what a reason to write like for 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 me and podcasting was all about knowing your why and like why do you have the show and you know who's your audience but for you to know your why and then come across a, a bridge to your mother through through writing that book that's powerful i did bring her back as a judgmental ghost she did she did arrive in present tense and that was fun but despite <laughs> that there was there was so much i learned from her and and understood what she went through and that made her into who she was. And that was so helpful. It's interesting as a child looking at their parents now as now as the child being an adult and trying to connect with your parents adult to adult is a, a new a new skill and, and ability to be able to think and appreciate your, your parents and the different generations and the different times and the struggles that you were unaware of as a child that they never really shared and just their perseverance to like you talk about with your father and all the things that he's lived through and and moving that much and not having a sense of home there's a lot of things that kind of feed who we are and shape us throughout absolutely. our life right absolutely you're so right dave um I think the, poss- the 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 main barrier is that we get to know our parents when they are parents. We have no idea of their previous life. Mm. So one of the things um, that has helped writers that I work with is to, there's a whole um, exercise we do with this, but imagining your parent as a child, as a five-year-old child, and seeing that beauty in them and that joyousness, that that hope, that, you know, the beautiful eyes, the beautiful face, the total vulnerability and acceptance of that, that child, you know, regardless of what happens to that child later, at that moment, as a five-year-old or whatever, they are perfection. Mm-hmm. And if you can embrace your parent, if you have a difficult parent you're dealing with, and I had to, to embrace them at that age gives you so much more ability to be close even if it's, you know, even if you struggle with it right now, it gives you more understanding, it gives you compassion, and it helps you to create emotional distance between yourselves so that you can embrace that parent. It's humanizing to see them in that way, yeah. right? So, yeah, especially if you've had a difficult relationship in the past with your family, or maybe you didn't really get to know your parents. Right. At all, right? Um so to see them in that light, I think that's those are wise words. I'm mm-hmm. I'm going to be processing that. That's really that's very insightful. I like that. Um, yeah, I got to think about that one. <laughs> and I hope everyone listening does the same. I'm like that's really I like that. So let's talk a little bit about what's inspiring you right now as an author. Is there someone that you seem to come across or fills your, your your thoughts as far as an inspiration as an author and 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 maybe what is it about that author that 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 captivates you? Well interestingly enough right now and I think it's because the project I'm working on is nonfiction right now, um, which is about the bridges of Portland and my, my switch to being an entrepreneur. Um, I'm reading Jeremy Narby's Intelligence in Nature. And it's revolutionized how I see the natural world. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of studies that um, examine how trees communicate, how single or- organisms communicate. How, and I'm still not sure about the word intelligence. Mm. I think awareness and consciousness are, are, are slightly different. But it also means, do we have a very narrow interpretation of the word intelligence, which goes to cognitive thinking and critical thinking and all that kind of stuff, right? So the inspiration for me is not just the extraordinary information that I've been finding out, is that it's changed my way of writing to being much more open to other influences. You know how you can get fairly closed off and say, oh, you know, that's nonsense. I I wouldn't (laughs) believe that. That's rubbish. Um, that's too woo woo or something. Yeah. Um, but it's actually opened me to thinking, you know, there's a possibility. There's always a possibility for this. 
And even though it's not within my scope of experience, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And that does incredible things for your writing. So that instead of, you know, going along the tried and true or using a matrix of strategies you've used before, you can actually throw them all out the window and do what you want. That's interesting. I had an interview with a a dad for my dad's space podcast, and he gave me a great little lesson. I don't think he meant to. I think it just happened during conversation, which I love, by the way, because it wasn't planned out or scripted. He gave me, he said his daughter came to him at like seven, eight o'clock PM and said, I want to go to the store and get ice cream. And he was like, I've had a long day in his mind. I've had a long day. I'm tired. We're settling in for the evening. I don't want to get in the car and drive to the store and get ice cream. But then he's looking at his daughter in that moment going, find a way to say yes. Mm. Just find a way to say yes. Mm. And he's like, okay, let's go to the store. And on the way back from the store, his daughter looked at him in the car and said, why isn't mom more spontaneous like you are? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't at that point, it wasn't about ice cream anymore. It was about being in the moment and, so, and finding a reason to say yes. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And I'm just like listening to you going, wow, how can we, how can we uncover that and develop that further as authors mm-hmm. is to find ways to say yes. And it goes to the, like an improv actor. Yes, and. Up on stage, right? Yes, and, right? There's no no. Be in the scene, be in the moment, and continue the story. So I think as an author, from what I'm listening to, talking to great authors on this podcast, is I'm hearing a lot of authors that are more improv than they acknowledge in their writing, where they're just doing that. What if I say yes to this? Where will it lead me? How does that resonate with you? Love it. Absolutely love it. There are, there are moments, um, like when I've been walking the bridges and making notes about them is what sensorily is happening to me right now in this moment, being buffeted by the wind or with this spectacular view over Mount St. Helens or being rained on. What's physically happening to me? What's that like? What does it do to my sense of being able to actually get out and walk like this. Who is that? Who is that person? And I think it, it, the reason why it's so inspiring for an author, for a writer, is that all that stuff comes back to your characters because then you've got everything in place to say what it was like to be in the rain, what it was like to see Mount St. Helens for the first time, what it was like to actually take that in and make that part of you, and then what does that do that character does it influence a choice that they make later in the Mm. book or a relationship that they have you know what what goes together and you trust yourself to put that in knowing it will come back okay so what about what have you let go of as an author that doesn't serve you anymore when you go to your writings something that you maybe you held on to and you thought you treasured but now you look at it a little differently. What have you let go of? I would a lot, but mostly uh, to do with being very specific about what language I use to describe. And I was always very much into that. You know, this I've got to get the feeling for this described perfectly, or the how the fire is burning. How do I describe that perfectly without using cliche? Without you know, maybe using some unusual simile. That used to power. The writing that I had and it worked you know I got a lot published but I eventually realized that's not the voice that I want I want something more authentic than that I don't want to write from a place of beautiful language I want to write from a place of somebody being able to connect with a character that I'm writing about so it's writing to truth constantly mm. writing to truth even if it's really painful and it sometimes it is okay so for those that haven't been on that path of writing to truth what would you say to them today as they look at a blank page going oh i don't know if i can do this well, how would you how would you encourage them today first of all it's get rid of the shoulder editor and it's always yep. going to tell you that you can't do it 
And the next thing is just to do something very basic. What can you see on your desk? What can you see around you in your living room? What can you see as you sit on your cushion in the corner? Um, it could be the carpet, right? Let's say there's a rug in front of you. What's it like to look at that rug? What can you see? And what does it turn into? I remember writing about a carpet that eventually it looked like I was staring down into a forest because it was sort of that one of those sort of puffy kind of carpets. So it looked like clumps of the tops of trees, you know, like orange broccoli or something. Yeah. And then just by doing that, I was able to sink into the forest and say, okay, what happens now that I'm down in the forest? What adult thinking and processing do you think harms an author? Because you're talking about imagination. You're talking about being more childlike in a sense where you're just seeing forest in a carpet. But mm -hmm. I can just hear an adult going, come on, get to work. We don't have time for this. Let's go. Stop daydreaming. Right. Is there anything that kind of sticks out? You're like, hmm, we got to stop talking like that. Exactly. That's your judge. That's your judge. And your judge is the, always the one that gets in the way between you and your writing, the self-doubt, the imposter syndrome, all of that is your judge. Your judge isn't going anywhere. Your judge has been out rowing on the river at dawn, has been doing push-ups in the corner all the time. <laughs> so what you need to do is to believe that one person is waiting for you to write the story. One person needs that story as a lifeline or as a moment of hope or as a reason to get up the next day. One person is waiting for that, write to that one person. Mm. And celebrate the small in the sense that if you write that book and only one person is impacted, mm -hmm. is that good enough for you? Is that Have you reached success with that? Definitely. Right. Definitely. If one person can say, because of this story that you wrote, Dave, mm. things changed for me and I was able to get up, I was able to get up the next morning and make coffee. Then that's yes, absolutely. That's that's life changing. Mm. Okay. See, I love that. <laughs> um, so one thing I think we talked about when we chatted was I think there was a comment around there's no such thing as a passive reader. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd kind of like to kind of think about that as we get close to the end of our our time together. How do we how do we write? with a vision of who will be reading our book. How much value do you put into that from your perspective? Um, I don't know about who, because that's a little specific. Yeah. But I believe, I think it was Michael Ondaatje who said, it. I think many people have said that, but I'm, I'm remembering the Michael Ondaatje version, is he said, write 80% of the book and let the reader supply 20%. Mm the matter of engagement that you were talking about whereas yeah. somebody feels like i they have a role in this whether it's to work out the clues in a mystery or to link the threads in a family history you know whatever it happens to be give your reader something to do to engage to be inspired by to want to reach further or deeper so that it's not just tv you know tv books or something yeah. that's just there to you know is fast food you don't want to do that you want somebody to feel something when they read your work so give them that 20 percent. so if we talk about an example like i walked into my grandmother's kitchen so in my mind i see 40 pies that have just come out of the oven <laughs> i see i see flour i smell smells of being of fresh baked pies i can the heat from the oven that's been on all day i see um i see fruit and i see pies at all different stages um again i'm overwhelmed by the smells just talking about it mm -hmm. and this is from 30 years ago right so you my impression of my grandmother's kitchen could be completely different than yours so instead of painting the picture for everyone as an author of exactly what's happening just say, I entered my grandmother's kitchen. And your your reader will then go to their version of grandmother's kitchen. Exactly. And then you can go there together. So 80-20, I love that rule. That's a great and also yeah, that. and also you have told us how much your grandmother loved you and the family. Without saying, My grandmother really loved us, take us into the kitchen and show us the pies. See? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I love how you just did that. That was so good. I didn't even I didn't even pick up on me saying it in that in that context, and you did that for me. So now I'm very happy. Um, <laughs> excellent. I I love having you on, Sandra, and I would encourage people to go check out. We're gonna have links in the show notes to all of your writings and and everything. I would love for you just to kind of, as we close off, Sandra, to, to address our audience and those authors that are listening and looking for that inspiration. You've given us so much to think about already, but I would love to get your encouragement to them in their author journey and uh, just get a little bit of your wisdom to help guide the next generation of authors that are listening. Find your beta readers, the people who will read your work for you, who you don't know really important and you can find them on facebook you can find them online there are groups of people who love to read new work and who will give you honest feedback find your community find your tribe and you can do it actively by getting involved with writers groups whether that's online or whether that's in your hometown very often libraries will have them there they are there and they are waiting for you and above everything believe that your story is worth writing and worth hearing or worth reading. There is someone out there waiting for you to do that. And you have a gift. The gift didn't come to you just brand new when you were born. There are people in your history who have been writers, who have been artists, who have passed that on to you. Your ancestors are lined up behind you right now, the voiceless and the faceless, and those whose stories were suppressed, those whose stories were brutalized out of them, they have made it this far to bring you this far. You are where you are now as a writer because of them. That is a gift. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> it's that great cloud of witnesses that are around us, cheering us on. And I think we almost devalue the message that we have in us by not giving the opportunity to, to write and to share that message and share our story. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you're right. It's beautiful. Um, Sandra, how do people connect with you? How do they find you? Um, where are you most active so people can reach out and, and speak with you directly? Absolutely. Uh, please feel free to grab me um, on my Facebook page, or you can grab me at my Gmail, Gmail address, uh, Sandra. What is it? Oh, no, it's not Sandra. It's Tiny Huntress. <laughs> there you at go. Gmail.com. Uh, so that's my that's my email address if you want to get in touch, or you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Beautiful, and we'll have links to all that in the show notes. Sandra, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. And every time I see a bridge now, I'm going to think of you. And <laughs> um, I really appreciate the time that you've you spent with us today. Thanks so much, Dave. It's been an absolute delight. Awesome. Thank you for being part of living the next chapter. Hey, look at we're we're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you. Livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah, 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 la di da and such. You, author, soon-to-be author, new author, currently writing your book author, published author, we need you here. The seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you. Livingthenextchapter.com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking, I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. We'll see you at livingthenextchapter.com. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. 
I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.